Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again, listeners. I appreciate your time. With me today is Anna, and we are discussing the end of life taboo topics. And apparently, they're so taboo, you guys wouldn't even tell me what you thought were taboo topics. I even threatened to haunt people on Instagram if they didn't tell me. And I guess I'm going to be a busy ghost because nobody told me what they thought uh, taboo end of life topics were. So, Thanks for joining me, Anna. I guess it's just going to be up to us to know what we're talking about today. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. You're welcome. So tell everybody a little bit about yourself before we jump into taboo topics. Sure. (laughs) So my name is Anna Cantor. I am a certified life coach and a dementia consultant inspired by Tipa Snow's positive approach to care. I have a... um, dementia coaching practice where clients reach out to me um, at different stages in their journey with their loved ones, um, whether they're spouses or, or daughters or sons. And I help guide them through the journey of their loved one's dementia, wherever they are in their path. Sometimes they're at the beginning stages, sometimes they're at the middle, sometimes they're at the end, sometimes their loved one has moved on, uh, passed on. And yes, I am a coach, a mentor, a guide, and my, I am, I'm called your dementia coach on different platforms. Ah, now I remember where we've connected. Got it. <laughs> awesome. So first off, thank you. How did you decide that we were going to discuss the end of life taboo topics today? Have you had an experience with that recently? Yes, I have. In fact, <laughs> I guess I have. Um, yes. Let me, I'll start with the backstory. Um, I, my mom was diagnosed with dementia um, 13 years ago, and she actually just passed away at uh, the beginning of August. So I am, I would say, I know that, you know, grief journey is not linear. Um, I'm, you know, in and out of different phases of different emotions, but I I enjoy or not enjoy. Well, I say I talk <laughs> about it very openly, but I think at the time that we discussed this topic, I, the biggest thing and the biggest taboo topic is you know, how do people from dementia pass away? And why don't people talk about it? And why can't we get more answers from hospice, from doctors, from, you know, support groups? And I found there is a big lack of not necessarily knowledge, but transparency, you know, and I have now, I think this is such a great time to record this podcast because before, as we know, my mom was on hospice and she transitioned to end of life in early August. And I have that whole experience now. I can look back and think what went as expected, what didn't go as expected. Um, And so I'm happy to share it with the community because I think it offers a lot of insight. Awesome. Well, I'm sorry for your loss having been there. I know it's, it's a weird feeling like you're, you're glad that their journey is over, Mm -hmm. but you're sad and you're glad their journey is over for you, Mm -hmm. but you're also sad. It's of course it it is. I don't, I don't feel the same way. Like my dad passed away basically from diabetes and my mom passed away from Alzheimer's and out of transparency, I made sure that her death certificate was correct. I had to Google it, but essentially in medical terms, it said she died from lacking lack of eating and drinking due to advanced Alzheimer's. Cause to me, that is a historical document and I wanted it to reflect reality and Mm -hmm. reality is Alzheimer's. She was 77, Correct. barely. Correct. She was turned 77 January 12th and died March 31st. So what is that? Not even three months. So it seems to me that a lot of people with some form of dementia, when they pass away, their death certificate says something else. And it, oh, there might be, right. could, there's probably contributing factors, but it's like, Yes. It's, you know, it's like back when people were accusing the government of mislabel or the medical profession of mislabeling COVID deaths. It's like, well, right. they died of a heart attack because of COVID or whatever. It's oh, like- no, I totally agree. I totally agree. Like if, for example, if my mom had gotten COVID and passed away and they put, if they would have put COVID on her death certificate, I would have had, I would have been really disappointed. I would, I would have gone in and been like, nope, this is wrong. She died from dementia, Alzheimer's. So, 
so a couple couple of key takes away key take takeaways um when we were originally planning this um i wanted to talk about taboo topics because i had recently posted on my page um on my dementia coaching page that i was inviting the community to um send their messages of her passing peacefully, right? And instead of, you know, I think when people are sick and I, or when they have chronic illnesses or it's a lot, oh, please send healing prayers and healing thoughts. I was like, no, not none, none of the healing thoughts, healing prayers, please. I want prayers of, of passing peacefully, of her transitioning into, um, you know, the next, the next, eternal eternity and i'm going to just give a quick disclaimer um i will talk a lot about maybe praying and um and that fact that she was catholic because i continue to honor that for her life because she couldn't make decisions on her own i am no longer practicing catholic i find myself very spiritual i can talk about i did go to church on her behalf um after she passed away but i always will say like i'll say things about praying and you know i might use the word god but i just wanted to give a disclaimer that i'm not trying to you know preach on anybody. <laughs> um, so I openly shared on my Instagram page these these wishes of her passing away. And now that she's gone and now that she's died, um, do do I have regrets of like hoping that she would pass away? I I don't. I don't. I have different feelings of, you know, you know, I will Definitely, if somebody if somebody said, "Oh, I can bring her back for like one day. Do you want to spend time with her?" Of course, I would say yes, right? She's my mom, but that doesn't discount the fact that she was. I was trying to give her the message that it was okay for her to transition. It was okay for her to pass peacefully, and so I brought it up a lot on my page about going there and just kind of communicating. You know, wow, when is when is it going to be time? Because here's the thing with dementia, late stage dementia. This person is they don't have, they don't have any quality of life, right? Are they, are they suffering? I don't think that they are. I don't think that my mom was suffering. So she was bedridden. She was, you know, given spoon fed and her body is just whittling away, right? She's losing her muscle. She's losing. And, and so you think here are the things that people, how people possibly have dementia. If they're mobile, they might fall. They might have, you know, broken hip and that expedites the end of life. Um, they get aspiration pneumonia because their brain starts to decline so much that they actually forget and don't remember how to swallow and they build up that phlegm and then it causes um, pneumonia. So those are the type of things where once they're in that late stage, you transition them to comfort measures only. So you're not thinking, okay, I'm going to cure the pneumonia or I'm going to solve the pneumonia. You just, you make them comfortable so that the pneumonia essentially expedites the process and helps with that transition to end of life. Um, and it's it's almost, this is what I mean by taboo topics. Having pneumonia or getting, a, or getting an infection or getting a UTI, it's almost like, oh, thank goodness, right? <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of. And this is why it's taboo because, you know, society is like, oh, why would you ever want that? Why would you ever wish that on somebody? Um, but I know for a fact that people in this community and people who have reached out to me on Instagram when I did post, um, shared shared that, you know, how I how I felt deeply that it was just time. And, you know, they were like, Thank you for sharing this. I think about this all the time and I don't I don't feel like I have a safe space to express it. Um, so my mom, um, in 2020, she actually did get an infection. She got a really bad UTI and went to the ER and there was a big lack of communication between this ER doctor who had never seen her, didn't know her chart, didn't know her history. It was the middle of the night. He called my brother and my brother, and he said, Hey, your mom's here. We're pushing antibiotics, right? Just sort of a no brainer. My brother, you know, a little frazzled, you know, sleep deprived was like, yeah, great, go for it. So my mom, um, she didn't eat for three days and we all thought that she was transitioning then that was in 2020. And she just, she just bounced back. I love that I had the last two years with her, but it was emotionally toxic because I thought that was her end of life transition. And so, and then she qualified for hospice and she's been, she was on hospice for over two years, but this, this next transition that happened, um, she, so yeah. And I, I don't, I don't want to stray off the topic of taboo topics, but 
the transition that happened, I was on a holiday and got a call from the hospice team saying that she had a fever and they were giving her morphine. And I said, I said, do you think she's transitioning to end of life? And they said, well, we're going to continue to monitor her. We're going to go in a couple of days and check on her. And I thought that they were, and I don't know if it's a liability thing or, but they just couldn't give me a straight answer. They couldn't tell me. And I came home from a holiday. I went in the very next day to see her and she was definitely dying. Like no doubt about it. Nobody called me. The hospice team didn't call me. The caretakers didn't call me. I didn't go. It wasn't necessarily that I went on a whim to visit her, but I hadn't seen her in a while because I was on a trip and I knew that she had been running a fever and she was on morphine. But that's another thing with, you know, this, maybe the more people I tell, the more they could figure out a really customized curated plan between their hospice workers and them to notify the family because their protocol was for the care home to notify hospice and for hospice to do an evaluation. And then I don't even know if it was in the, in the, in the steps to notify family. I actually don't even know. I don't even know that I would have been called. I feel like they would have just called me and said, Hey, your mom died. Ooh, they shouldn't so, have. Well, Mom, not for, I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure. So I think that the taboo topics are knowing that, you know, death is not an, it's not a science, it's an art. Everyone <laughs> transitions differently and being at peace with the fact that you want somebody to pass away and having a community that supports that. Right. Cause a lot of people, I feel like they feel so isolated and they're like, my parent has, um, so one of my clients, her mom actually passed away about a week or 10 days after my mom, very similar stories, early onset, you know, bedridden for the past three, five years. And, you know, it's that process where you are so grateful for that process to go the way it went. But for my mom, it just, I felt like it took a long time. It was a very, very, very slow, slow decline. But then the transition to end of life was very fast because the day that she died, I went there and I saw her breathing and it was very symbolic of somebody dying. And, and I haven't told this story and I probably won't use this space to do it, but it was very peaceful. It was very peaceful. I was with her. She, I know she was not in pain. Well, people can say, how do you know? I'm like, I have a feeling. I have a pretty, pretty strong feeling she wasn't in pain. But the hospice team even said, okay, well, we're going to make our rounds and we'll come in at 4 p.m. to check on her. Hospice wasn't there. Nobody was there. It was just me. It was just me. Mm. I have fears that my mom was alone because she passed away in within the two weeks of the at the beginning of the pandemic when... You know, they shut down all the whole state. I'm in California. And on the on March 16th, it's like all of the counties in the San Francisco Bay Area were, you know, mm-hmm. basically shut down order, stay at home. I forget what we called it. And I couldn't go see her. Thankfully, um, I don't even know if this was OK or not. I mean, talk about, you know, challenging, but. My mom had hospice because I wanted the care staff at the memory care to have extra help. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt like everybody was going to need it. And that didn't even take into account the pandemic. Yeah. um, They called me on Sunday, the 29th and said, you know, like my mom wasn't doing very well. And they thought she'd benefit from a visit from me, which I now know was probably just totally made up story. Um, I went in the next morning. So Monday, the 30th, Mm -hmm. and I saw her. And as soon as I saw her, I was like, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> and I, I, you said something very, very important. You said, I think that your mom will benefit from a visit from you. That mm-hmm. is, that is doctor talk for your mom is dying. Yeah, I learned that. And they still do that. That's, that's another thing about the industry is that's so funny because that's what they say. I think your parent, I think your mom, I think your spouse will benefit from a visit from you, a.k.a. They're transitioning to end of life. And my thing is like, why don't, why can't they just tell us? Why can't they just say it? Well, I'm not asking to, I'm not asking for them to say, oh, your mom is going to pass away on this day at this time. Yeah. But 
<laughs> the, the train is the, leaving the station between X and Y on right. Tuesday. And I think that looking back on my mom's journey and her decline is there was not a sense of urgency or imminency. And I thought that that's what hospice was for. They were preparing like, okay, come in. You know, I think your mom could benefit from a visit, right? I mean, my brother and, lives in town. I was a, I was out of town, but my brother lives here. And he was not informed at any point. And mm. he was not able to get there in time because he was at work. And he said, oh, I'll go visit her after I get off work. Mm. Right? Do you think he would have left his desk to go visit her while she died? Yes, she would have. But there was no sense of... There, that wasn't that yeah it wasn't communicated to us do you think that it's because it's harder to know see i didn't get so the person that called me was a younger staffer caregiver from the memory care and and she and i had had a fairly close relationship over the my mom was there for three years she'd been there for close to two and so we had developed a rapport and a friendship and I'm sure they probably don't want to say anything because they're not doctors. They're not medical mm -hmm. professionals. Mm -hmm. And they're probably trying to avoid like hysterics on the other end of the phone. And the right. only reason that I, when I saw my mom, the only reason that I had any clue that we were not going to get better, like the mm -hmm. hit leg would heal. And because I don't know if you know, my mom fell. And broke her leg. Mm -hmm. So she expedited her end yep. that way. Yep. Um, but you know, and because she was 77, she was still verbal, she was still walking. I mean, like she didn't have, I mean, she was definitely in late stage, but she wasn't like end stage Alzheimer's. She was getting close. I figured she had a couple, two, three years tops. Right. Um, we did not. But the only reason I knew what was going on with her, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but my listeners know I have golden retrievers and right before my dad died, we had one that did not quite make it to the vet. Um, she was pretty much gone when we got there and the vet had to explain what agonal breathing is. And that's kind of, I mean, the dog and my mom pretty much look the same. Yeah. It's, it's the short. <laughs> yeah. The panting. It right. looks like agonies. Yep, exactly. Like they're in pain, but they're not. And right. And that's I, exactly what my mom looked like when I saw her, but she had been like that for hours before. And it doesn't take a genius to know that somebody's dying. I, I wanted to know what it looked like. And so I just YouTubed hospice visits, end of life. What does it look like when yikes. somebody dies? <laughs> that must I mean, have been a that, rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, it was, I was curious about it when she first transitioned to hospice. Oh, so it because wasn't... I I wanted specific specifically I was concerned about um, transitioning to end of life because you stop eating and drinking, but I learned that it's quite a, a very peaceful way to pass, and I I that gave me that gave me a sense of comfort, right? As her daughter, it gave me a sense of comfort, and so I think and and you said something else that was was really interesting. Um, you said. Oh gosh, now I, this is why I need to take notes. But <laughs> so it's it's yeah, and and as soon as I saw my mom, I knew I knew it was going to happen. I wasn't really sure, and I just wanted the person that helped me the most. Oh, I know what you said. Sorry, I know a cliffhanger, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you said that. Um, oh gosh, you might have to edit this out because my brain. <laughs> I just, I had, tell it, the editors I just that. had it in my head. Um, the editing team can clean this section up, please. <laughs> you, oh my God, what did you just say? You said something about, oh, something, you said something about, um, like, you tell somebody something and they become, like, weary or scared or something like that. Like, Yeah, but I think that they're... Yeah hesitant 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 yeah to to basically say i think you need to come because right. it okay. looks like they're going to transition yes they're soon. hesitant they're hesitant to use those bold words those that bold statement and i had the same thing happen to me all throughout this process even after she passed away the person who came to take her i had to call a funeral home and there's this whole process involved and they come and they take the body and everything and they 
were very hesitant to answer my questions. And I think they were walking on eggshells because I know it's delicate time. I know when somebody dies, it's a delicate time. But in my case, and I don't, I, I, I really would like to know how many people I speak for. When you have a loved one who has dementia, who has late stage dementia, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just a typical, or I mean, I'm not talking about another form of death. I'm very specific to end of life dementia, right? And this person has been declining and it's been 13 years and, you know, it's, you've, been waiting for this moment and it was peaceful. I was asking the person who was tra- taking her back to where she was going to be kept until her funeral and viewing and all that stuff. Like, well, where, where is she going? What does it look like? You know? And this person was looking at me as if I was crazy, like asking all these questions, like, you want to know this? And she's like, well, we're going to, we're going to put your mom into a bag. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. I get it. Like put her in the plastic or zip her up. Right. And it was like, she was almost as if like, why would you want to know this? You know, like, aren't you like, and this doesn't mean that I wasn't sad and I wasn't emotional, but I wanted to know all of this. And that's the thing with the beginning. So going back to the person that helped me, I had a death doula on my side, somebody who I met through the, my coaching space. And I reached out to her and I said, I said, I need your help. Hospice isn't telling me anything, but my mom is she has that raspy breath. And this wasn't panic. It wasn't panic. I wasn't like, help me, please. You know, but I said, Hey, I really could use your, your support, you know, emotionally. I'd like, can you do a video chat? Can you just look at, can you look at my mom? And she's like, yes, of course. And so she did a quick, um, I did a quick, uh, FaceTime chat and she goes, she goes, your mom, she, you know, she looks peaceful and, and she's very sedated, but I mean, I don't know if she was, she wasn't sedated, but she was on, um, morphine. And she goes, she has minutes to hours left, minutes to hours. And of course, you know, I think with this new, with this new, like you, you, like there's coaches and there's doulas and there's, that's not something I'm not going to hold her liable. Be like, oh, she died in a day. Like you said the wrong thing. Right. But I think that's the, that's what happens with the mindset of, you know, traditional nurses and doctors and hospice caregivers, because they're like, I don't want to say the wrong thing, you know, like liability. But in this relationship between myself and this death doula, she said, I don't even know. She might have even said seconds to minutes. She told me exactly what was going to happen. She told me what happens when you die and the sounds and the the things that go on. Um, and it was all accurate. It was all accurate. And that's what I wanted to know. That's what I needed to know in that moment. Not everybody might need to know that. But that's another thing with these taboo topics is, you know, if you are the type of person that benefits from that information, and if that will help you through your journey, then there are people that will help you along the way, right? It might not Mm -hmm. be the hospice team. It could be a coach or a friend or a mentor or a death doula, right? I wasn't present at the passing of either of my parents. My dad was a handful and they lived 20 miles away. So it was like a 35 minute drive. And he, he wasn't nice at the end. So it was very difficult to be with him. I was just very grateful that the last day that I saw him was I, he had gone down the hall to use the facilities. This was in his own home. And as he came back down the hall, I stood up, I gave him a big hug. I said, I love you. And then basically the next five days were a nightmare for everybody. And then he passed away like about 10 o'clock, 1030 in the evening. And, you know, hospice was like, do you want to come sit with the body before we take it away? And I'm like, no, (laughs) rolled over. I had the best sleep I had in weeks, which felt it still feels weird. Yes. But then with my mom, so the the care staff gal called and said, you know, Think mom would benefit from a visit from you. And I, I showed up and like I said, as soon as I saw my mom, I was like, yeah, this isn't ending the way I was expecting. So that was a little bit of a shock, but again, not a hundred percent surprising, but I had to make a decision in that exact moment. Like, do I talk to her as her daughter? She has thought I'm her best friend for, I don't know how many years, many, like I did, it was like, I'm like, whatever. I'm just talking to her like I'm the daughter because that's what I am. And if she doesn't remember that, you know, it's like, whatever. If that doesn't penetrate, I, I, whatever. And so I just told her, you know, you've done a really great job and, you know, we're all going to be fine. And I just, I must have said that for like mm-hmm. 20 minutes, just kept reassuring her that 
everybody be fine. She didn't need to be. My family is huge right. control freak. So I'm like, <laughs> we'll be right. fine. Feel free yeah. to move along. <laughs> yeah. And those messages of letting go, I think there's, they sense it, you know, there, there's something there. And I think um, it was about, it was a little bit more than 12 hours because that was like mid morning on Monday and they called at lunchtime on Tuesday and said, come now. And we were there within like 25 minutes and she was already gone. But again, this was at the very beginning of COVID, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, hospice was not doing as much as they had told me they were going to do, but do I fault them for it? I mean, hello, the whole world was trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Right. right. And my mom, I don't know that they needed to help. I don't, I don't know that they didn't do things they shouldn't have done. I don't know yeah. what they did because I wasn't allowed to be there, which was kind of frustrating, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I find it really interesting that the, the mortuary, the funeral home was like <laughs> almost appalled by your questions Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Kind of. I mean, they they were looking at me like I was crazy, and I was. It was me. It was my me, my brother, the death, the death, um, death doula. doula. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm gonna. I don't think she would mind if I. Her name's Amelia Death Doula on Instagram, and you guys can look her up. And I'm sure she would love the shout out. So awesome. Well, I might look <laughs> and, look her up and, and yeah. connect that to this conversation. Be kind really of, cool. Yeah, kind of. I mean, and she's like been allowed been around out of life, and and that's yes. And I think that. The other thing that I think that the, the big thing that you mentioned that, you know, we can bring up as another taboo topic is this idea of feeling, uh, what, did, what did you say? You, you, the feeling of, you know, relief and um, just the readiness for it to pass and to talk about that openly and freely without remorse or guilt from a society that views death is something bad and something that (laughs) something to avoid (laughs) something to avoid and to be completely clear it's this death of my mom has been heartbreaking and beautiful and you know and comforting at the same time right and that Mm -hmm. dynamic of emotions i think that's what people are like really unwilling to process and unwilling to feel it's like wait can you feel like you can't feel happy and sad at the same time, right? It's like, actually I can, and I have, and I know because, you know, I have been hit with waves of emotion and grief. And the biggest thing with my mom dying is like, it's almost like this 13 year cloud has been lifted. And I, the grief that I'm feeling now is grieving my mom, who she was before she died, Mm -hmm. because I haven't been able to really process it. It's been 13 years of her not knowing who I was, of, you know, losing her as a, as a mother, you know, losing her, ability to talk to for me to confide in her and all of a sudden i was like wow i i I remember so much of her before she got sick and my brother said the same thing which i think was really interesting like yes that's so weird like now that mom's gone like i remember i can hear her voice i can hear her laugh i can remember these memories that we have and i'm cherishing those they of course they make me sad of course they do and i'm also very happy that she is rested and you know that she has moved on And you earlier, you mentioned, you know, that many people with um, advanced cognitive issues aspirate food and get pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And 
I had always told my husband and my daughter, who's um, going to be 31 this year, 2022, that if my mom got pneumonia, we were going to call hospice mm -hmm. because I was not going to prolong dying from Alzheimer's right. over quality of life, which obviously was diminishing every day. Mm -hmm. And the reason I told both of them, because one, I was pretty sure my sister would fight me tooth and nail, which isn't logical if you take out the stigma. It's like, yeah, we're all going to die. It doesn't make sense. Do you want right. to get hit by a bus? Yeah. Or do you want to die sleeping in your yeah. bed or what? Like if you can and pick. That, yeah, that's why you have to you have to advocate for that person. And you have to establish kind of a, a person in that role. Pow power of attorney, like my brother and I both have power of attorney. And so we knew for many, many years that my, my well, not many years, but my mom has been on comfort measures only for a long time, which is why I brought up that episode where she went to the hospital two years ago and they gave her antibiotics because you know, if I look back, that that possibly could have been the transition to end of life. Masking that with pain meds, with morphine, so that she's comfortable, but essentially using that to to help transition her to end of life. Right? Everything happens for a reason, right? I'm just gonna say the cliche thing: it all happens for a reason. I'm, I mean, and then there was COVID, and I I really didn't get to see her for many years. Well, I didn't, I didn't get to see her for probably 18 months. I could go look at a window, but I was an essential worker. You know, they weren't allowing anybody in, but the hospice team, she, it was almost a blessing in disguise because, because she had qualified for hospice, like right before COVID, they were still allowed to go visit her. So they went twice a week and did Zoom calls with me. And she was in a small care home that was run by um, a family and it's all, they all, it all, you know, I obviously I have some complaints, but um, for the most part, this hospice team Zoom, I was able to Zoom with my mom and just see her and they took extra care of her because I think that I had had she not qualified for hospice, I think she probably would have. Um, well, I wouldn't have been able to see her because this this care home was they weren't like the most tech savvy. And I don't <laughs> think I could say like, hey, can you Zoom with me like twice a week because they have other residents to take care of and. So that's one good thing that happened. Um, and if I, eventually like, we were able to go in and visit her and see her. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's why with, yes. Yeah, so, so again, advocating for your loved one, making sure you have a plan and that, and another thing is, you know, I help with coaching is just fam like almost like family mediation because a mm -hmm. lot of times, you're the caretaker, right? And you need to make the best decisions. And then you got Aunt Myrtle or cousin Joe who's like, wait, what? You're gonna, yeah. you're not, you're not gonna, gonna like cure, you're not gonna cure their pneumonia. And you're like, just gonna you let want, them die. And that's the thing, exactly. That you want them to die. Taboo topic, right? Well, yeah, it's I th I see it changing because I think at the end of 2019 20 i think it was 2019 it was before my mom died so it had to be in 20 i talked to barbara carnes who is a hospice nurse was she's an, uh, a, a speaker and teacher at this point and for those of uh, those of you listening that are on instagram you probably have seen hospice nurse julie so hospice nurse jewelry Ju julie blah, easy for me to say is the next generation of Barbara Carnes. Okay. And I listen to a lot of what they say. The reason I wanted to talk to Barbara is because there was a gal in my support group, the one that I was part of, not the one I facilitate, who what is, is Catholic, her husband was Catholic, could not accept that this man was dying from Alzheimer's. The doctor mm -hmm. said he probably had four months and you would have, her reaction probably could not have been worse if the doctor had backhanded her across the face and said something that I'm not going to, well, this is a clean podcast. So, yeah. I mean, it was just <laughs> denial. Yeah. And I mean, she did. And she you know, was in a support group. She was in an Alzheimer's support group. Okay. And, you know, we were on zoom because he died in August of 2020 so, so she didn't accept that he died from Alzheimer's? He was she was, at the she, support group after he passed away? Yeah. No, okay. she didn't accept that he was dying. So when he oh, okay. stopped okay. eating, she's shoving food in his mouth. She's shoving uh, ice cubes in his mouth. And she, you know, everybody kept saying, you need to call hospice. You need to call hospice. You know, the support group, those of us in the support group, like 
My mom died like just a few months before this. And I'm telling her, you need to call hospice. And of course, you know, smack in the middle of COVID, she did not get the best hospice company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the equipment she claimed came dirty. And but it was just it was like. I don't know if a transfer chair being not super sparkly clean is a big deal. I you know I don't know what it looked like, but anyway, it was just like she was in so much pain mm-hmm. because she just refused to accept that he was dying. I'm like, he's gonna die of something, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, please stop. And it was so painful for me because right. I'm like, I've already been through this, and I knew where she lived because I had sent her a card. I like literally, I'm like, I am about to drive over to this gal's house and basically bitch slap her across the face to get her attention and snap her out of this crap because yeah. I'm like, she's hurting him. She's hurting herself. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I, I think have there's, yeah, there's a big, I think when you're grieving and you're going through loss, there's a big disconnect with reality. And I also think that, I mean, and you mentioned her being Catholic and I want, I just want to say like, I don't necessarily think that her being Catholic had a lot to do with her denial, but I think sometimes, you know, you leave thing, you leave fate. I it's I don't know, like where am I going with this? But I got the I got the impression she felt like God had forsaken like, her, and I'm not religious. Like that. Yeah, it was just. I mean, yeah. it was it was like can't somebody or like we're all trying on like on a Zoom call. To yeah. help this gal. Can't well, somebody help her and help him? For, I'm like, oh my God, when yeah. he finally died, I was like, oh, thank God. I think right, I was happier right. he died than my mom died. Oh, gosh. Because, because Did she, she continued to go to the support group after that. Oh, yeah. Then it, the Alzheimer's Association now has, I'm not sure, I think it started in 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because I think I had just become disqualified for their new Alzheimer's grief support groups so people like me would transition out of the support group for caregivers and into the grief support group and you get to be in there for two years and my mom i had i've started facilitating my own support group with them so yeah um, you know i had to figure out how to handle all my feelings right right. while sitting in the house that i was sitting in for two years Mm. losing somebody during covid is really hard Right. It's interesting about, um, you know, what, how religion plays a role with people's perception and interpretation of death and dying. And, you know, and, and, you know, it's always, you know, everyone has their own reaction to things. But what's interesting is because I had, we, we did a Catholic burial for my mom. So we had a priest, you know, lay her casket down in the ground. We chose to bury her in a Catholic cemetery. And then I decided one of the best things that I, think I did for for her was I had her name read during a Catholic mass in the what's called the prayers of the faithful. And so they say for those who have died and they list names and then the whole community will say, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, Basically, it's a quick version of it. But and so they said her name at one of the church service and I hadn't been to church in years, but it was one of those services that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Jewish or Buddhist or non-denominational or agnostic. The message that he said that the priest said during that service could resonate with anybody, you know? And so, so there was that, but then also it's like in Catholicism and this woman who's like grieving and in pain and, 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 and um, in denial, the goal is to live your life as one of God's followers and then die so that you can go to heaven and like be with him at the right hand or the father and, and sit at his eternal banquet, Right. That's the goal of your life as a Catholic. So I think it's interesting. This is just my opinion, but I think it's interesting when people are super religious and they're just like blaming the death on, you know, like God didn't do this and he didn't do this. Right. It's like, isn't that the purpose for him, for them to move on and be with him? (laughs) That's what I I was like. I couldn't believe. I mean, she was similar. Like it's funny because he had the same name as my husband. I'm going to try to keep this slightly anonymous. And my husband's a foot taller than me, about a hundred pounds more than me. We have discussed why I will never be his caregiver because one, he won't accept it. And two, it's not even physically possible. So she was in a similar situation other than the acknowledging that she was never going to be his caregiver because she was, and she did a fantastic job, but he got aggressive and Mm -hmm, she was mm -hmm. 
physically injured. Oh, and yeah. it was very scary because he would get angry with her and he would pound on her and just, oh, it was just yeah, terrifying. That's really, that's really sad. And, that's- you know, so it's like, I wonder if, because I know a lot of caregivers feel like this, and I don't know if you felt this way, and I, I, I'm not even sure it's rational. I think we all feel it, but it's like the the disease is progressing and that, you know, somehow we make it like, because we're not doing the right thing or we're not good enough or you know, it's like we're lacking. So the disease is progressing, which makes zero sense. But I think subconsciously, I think a lot of people feel that way. And maybe that yeah. was what was going on with her is that she just felt like if she was a better wife or a better caregiver or a better whatever, maybe he wouldn't have gotten angry with her. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten Alzheimer's. I don't know. It was yeah. just, I yeah. finally had to bow out of that, that support group because right. seeing her so desperately sad Mm-hmm. through a, t- a computer monitor just just laid me out i just yeah. i couldn't i'm like i have my own crap to deal with so she yeah and that's that's the thing where i think um you know as you know as a dementia coach i can wholeheartedly speak to i am and i have i am in therapy i have a therapist that i've t- been well i've had m- different ones but i started I started the year my mom got diagnosed with dementia, right? I have gotten a lot of benefit from um, having a life coach and somebody to guide the process of here was where you are now. Like, let's see where you can get to, right? Let's use tools. And then there's there's value in looking at your past and saying like, this might be affecting you now and this is how you can come to terms with it. So there's all these avenues for, you know, getting the support and the mental health you need. I don't, think that one is more important than the other it just depends on what you need and who you are is where you are in your journey right so so i have a quick question for you and then i know you have to go <laughs> i try to remind caregivers they cannot give up on their dreams they have to always keep their own needs in mind because nobody else is doing it it might yeah. your dreams might look different they might take longer Mm-hmm. But eventually this caregiving season is going to be over. And where are you going to be when that happens? Now, for this particular gal, everything about her life stopped because of COVID. And then her husband died and nothing. there was nothing to go back to. It was just sitting in the house and being sad. She right. didn't really have an other alternative, mm-hmm. which I could relate to because I was in a similar position, but I at least didn't live alone. Um, but I also lost a dog. So it's like, I lost my mom and then the dog and then my grandmother, like in less than 13 months, it was fun, fun times. COVID was fun times. But do you feel that by keeping your needs and goals in mind that after she passed, it was like, yes, you can feel sadness and grief. And then the the happiness Mm -hmm. that she's no longer suffering from Alzheimer's but then you also have kind of like this other thing to keep to focus on instead of trying to figure out, well, now what do I do? I Is have that- kind of, I, yeah, it's interesting. I, I do have, um, yeah, I have kind of a, a two part answer. So I think I've had, I've had two kind of like a weird identity, not identity crisis, but one was after I was, I care, I was caring for my mom for over three years, full-time caregiver, well, full time, I would work like eight to four, and then we had a nighttime caretaker, and I would go work at a restaurant. I was a, a server at a restaurant, and my mom moved into a home. And when I wasn't caring for her anymore, I kind of lost my sense of identity. I, it only been for three years, but that was enough to really like change your way of life. I, I was living in Germany. I moved home from Berlin. I was like living my life. I had a I had a boyfriend. It, like that relationship dissolved because. I, I'm pretty sure it dissolved because of like the stress I had with my mom. So like all these little things impacted my life. All, all the things about caring for her impacted my life. And then she moved into a home and I had this like huge identity crisis. Like, what is my purpose? Like, what am I doing? Right. So I just started, I, that's when I started a career as, um, as um, I, I've been an executive assistant for 10 years and that's gives me a really good backbone to being a coach. Cause I do a lot of administrative stuff for clients. Um, and so I moved into that role and now that my mom has passed away, I'm having this other crisis where I'm like, wait, I needed a job. I needed to work like a nine to five and get out of the restaurant industry. And like, I needed 
security and like job benefits when she moved. But right now I'm like, I don't really know if I need that anymore. It's like the only really really reason I found this this job is because I she moved into a home and it was the right time. I could actually work Monday. I could work eight to five, whereas before I was caring for her at those hours. So now I'm like, hmm, let me go back to like, what am I really passionate about? You know, like, um, you know, I, I mean, I started my coaching practice like three years ago, kind of as a, a passion project during COVID. And <laughs> I was always a person who wanted to turn pain into passion. And I even wrote about it early on in blogs when I was taking care of my mom in like 2010 and 2011. But yeah, like we're like, even now I'm, I'm kind of at a crossroads. Like, you know, I, I thought that maybe she would pass away and I'd feel like, well, being a dementia coach, like there is an element of like, it brings up a lot of like, it's almost you know, I'm continuing like take ripping the bandaid off, you know, but I don't really feel that way. I feel like there's so much more now. Like it's like where they, I was talking about these memories that I have with my mom and it's like, I finally have clarity really. And, you know, I'm, I, I want to write a book about her life to honor her. I want to um, just help people in different capacities, but it's almost like because of her dementia, it gave me this path that I'm on now. So when you say like people have to take care of themselves and they have to like find their passion, it's like, Yes, having somebody with dementia and losing a loved one could alter your your passion and your path. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be the it. You can't blame that for you not fulfilling your dreams and your passions. I don't think. I agree. I don't and think after, you can blame it. After so, my mom died March of 2020. My the dog that treated me like he was always touching me. He was literally my soul dog. Yeah. November of 2020. And then my paternal grandmother, April of 21. Mm -hmm. And in April of 21, my husband somewhat exasperated said, you know, you can do whatever you want. And I literally had a mental panic attack thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to be 55. And, if I'm, and I'm like, whoa, yeah. back up the truck, honey. You don't <laughs> have to decide now. And yeah, what ended up happening by the end of 21 was not on the radar. <laughs> So, and it's just, I have had, because I kept my needs as equal to mom's needs, not more so, or I mean, it's like sometimes mom needed more things and sometimes, Hey, it's my turn and you can take the secondary role. You know, it was a like yin and yang, just like every other relationship. You know, I just, I feel like I can look backwards and go, okay, the path I'm on, I'm like, I'm close. I need to make an adjustment. And it's like, you know, every day is not going to be perfect. That's life. Yeah, but yeah. I feel like, I feel like you, I have like the cloud is lifted and I can, the cloud is lifted. Yeah. I can see things differently. It took a little longer for me, I think, because, you know, my mom died and then it was like, well, now, now, it, oh, we're still sitting here at home. Okay. So, yeah. but I can, yeah. I can end this with a taboo topic because, and I, this is such a huge frustration for me. My dad being the frugal guy that he it was, and I am the same way, so that is no way criticism, chose the cheapest way to be dealt with after his death. <laughs> so he was a Marine for four years. He mm -hmm. chose a military cemetery for his ashes to be interned at. And my mom is supposed to be there as well. When my mom died, I told my sister I want to do a um, dessert bar because my mom was a huge sugar fiend. And I wanted to do it in the backyard of the home that my mom had that we were renting out that we were mm -hmm. then selling. Mm -hmm. COVID screwed all that up. My sister's like, I don't want to do two things. I'm not paying for two things. Guess what? <laughs> I My mom is still with me. And it's been two and a half years. Cremated? Yep. That's okay. Why? Well, I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure my mom's family thinks that I'm all sorts of, this is a clean podcast. So just insert your thoughts there. Yeah. But you can't control their thoughts, right? No. It, and it frustrates me because I know... I know my mom wanted to be scattered in different places, mm -hmm. but there's a part of me that's like, well, shouldn't she sort of be with my dad? And maybe so, I could do sort of some of yeah. both. Yeah. So that's, that's a, that's a, that's a project you start working on in, in pieces, right? Like I have a, one of my best friends, her, her dad passed away a few years ago and he is partially in a Ziploc bag in her shoe, in her closet. Okay, mom's in a nice box. She hasn't. That I she hasn't figured. Out, she hasn't. She hasn't decided yet. She wants to pick a nice urn or like make him into something. And and it is there. 
it's, you know, unless it's creating a net negative and it's compounding, like I feel guilty for this and then, 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 then it starts to like become an issue. But, you know, that's, that's the thing with like people who, well, you know, another thing that, you know, I offer is just, we sit in a space where you get all that clutter out of your head and all these, I'm supposed to do this and this is wrong and society doesn't think this and everyone's going to get mad at me. Like narrowed it down, you know, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, figure out, you know, is there a plan going forward? Like, would you like to travel to, you know, to be said, where does your mom want to be? Where, where does she want to go? Is your dad buried somewhere? Like, no, he's just he, interned at a military a mili cemetery that isn't even convenient to any of the family. It was so. What would be your? You want your mom to be with him in what capacity? Well, it's like, a, well, first off, it's paid for. So. Well, I know, but so so <laughs> like no, I said, literally, frugal is not so bad. This is this is this is the this is what's interesting about like you know. So your mom is she have her ashes. Yeah, and they're in a right? box that they're will in fit in the in the niche okay. with my dad. And your dad is also ashes. Is he a yes. cremated? Yes. Okay. And is he is he he has a military cemetery. Cemetery. And there's probably I don't know what it's called, but it's like a little room, and you go in and you see people's boxes, and there's like a plaque. Yeah. Well, it's like a yeah, it's like a wall, and yeah, there's a okay. plaque, and I don't know if we can okay. add to the plaque. See, I called them. Um, right. More than a year ago, and said, "Okay, it's time that this is the cemetery." And they said, "You have to jump through all these hoops." So I said, "No, I don't. It's all done. Okay. We've just been waiting because of COVID." And right. they gave me some BS, and I said, "Never mind," and I hung up because I hate dealing with that kind of stuff. I immediately get nasty, which obviously is not a benefit to anybody. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, whatever. <laughs> so, and I think because in my heart, it's like my mom wasn't in the military. Most of my met dad's military, it was only in only, I don't want to diminish so, it. It was only in for four years and only like one and yeah. a half of it when they were married. Okay. So, so just, like, I'm going to give you a little, her. a little, a little insight. This is, this is, this is, you know, we have to take away all the clutter. There's lots of clutter in, you know, what, what you want to do for your parents. So who, who wants your mom to be with your dad? Is it somebody? Is it you? Is it family? Is it, you think they want that? I, th I would assume that my sister is expecting that. Okay. Although there's nothing but stopping her from her doing how, it. Like, I guess logically, like, how does that work? Is your, and that's the thing, you know, with this military base, you really only need to ask one question is like, is there a spot for me to have a little tiny urn next to my dad? Yeah, there's space in his niche for her. Okay. So it's all, it's like, I guess to me, right. it's all about him. And there's, it's like, oh, and her. So like the, well, the plaque so, on the front is about him. I don't know where that's her. Okay. So you have you have ashes, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you know you find there's um there's companies you can you can get like a little rock paperweight, mm -hmm. and you could make her ashes into some sort of like paperweight, like a little tiny thing, or you know you know like regardless of like his urn's bigger than her urn, you could get like a little one put next to her, and then you could go out to like three different sites and spread her somewhere, and then you could keep some for yourself. I thought about just doing scattering her most places and then just putting the box in the niche. But I guess part of me feels like that's not respectful to my sister, which is annoying. We don't have a relationship. So it's like too much clutter. So I have just have not decided to do right. anything, which is probably not helping. <laughs> right. Why does your sister like want some of your mom in a, her own little urn? I have no idea. Memory? She did not want to do a celebration of okay. life. And nobody yeah. has suggested. So you make, you make the you make the decision, and then cross that path when you get there. If somebody has any sort of opinion about it, yeah, I'm getting closer to that. <laughs> it's like, you know, I mean, it's paid for. He's there. I know how she would feel about. I think she'd be torn too. It's like she wants to be with him, but she also wants to be scattered. So I yeah. guess I need to do both. Yes. Road trip. Do both. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Exactly. I you would know, have done it on our road trip in 2021, but I had shingles, which is horrible. If you get to 50, get the get the vaccine, people. Trust me on that one. Um, I just wasn't in the mental space to do that. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Oh, we're going to the yeah. Rose Bowl parade. My mom loved the Rose we, Bowl parade. Yeah. <laughs> but I think yes, you a, have you have to go. <laughs> <laughs> we talked way too long. We've had some technical glitches. We got we got off topic a little. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> but right. I appreciate this. Again, sure. I'm like, I am sorry <laughs> that you've had to go through my stupid thing falling off the mic all the time mm -hmm. that you've had to go through all of this in yeah. just a short period of time. 
with Ma, I mean, I know how that feels. The relief, the sadness, the whole, why do I feel all these things? I think it's pretty normal, but I think it's also unique to people who have dealt yeah. with somebody with, yeah. with dementia. So it's been, it's been a crazy journey and that's yeah. why I think, <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely crazy, you know, which is why instead of everything's always in my head and that is, that's just a recipe for disaster. So I'm slowly, slowly, slowly getting some ideas out and I am planning on writing about it wherever that lands i'm not sure it doesn't matter but um yeah and you know i i i guess yeah that's a good stopping point i'm i'm happy to talk openly about anything if people want to find me they can do they can book a consult or just you know follow me so you guys all know her links are all in the show notes so it's easy to find yes well thank you so much i will let you you run off and help other people and if you ever if you ever want to talk i'm here too yes thank you so much fading memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts